faults are really common structures in sedimentary basins and they're also therefore really common on seismic reflection profiles. The ability to interpret faults on these profiles is important if we want to understand the tectonics of the sedimentary basins, but also even if we just want to reconstruct the sedimentary layers, we do need to understand how faults can be interpreted and how to reconstruct them. So in this short presentation we'll be looking at ways to identify faults and then to trace them out or to pick them through the seismic profile. We're going to worry a little bit about the resolution of the seismic image and how this impacts on how we interpret faults. And we want to address the issue of how much complexity we might see on a seismic profile results from real structural complexity and how much is due to the seismic imaging being disrupted by the presence of faults. So here we have a package of reflectors running across the image representing some kind of stratigraphic formation. And we can see that this is broken and offset by features here, which we would infer are faults. So faults are breaks in this formation, and these breaks show offsets. And we can trace the continuity of these faults away from the formation of interest, up dip, and down, and we can show the sense of movement by these half arrows. So when tracing faults, this is what we want to do. We want to identify the continuity of the faults, their planes in three dimensions, lines in the profile, and we want to interpret the sense of movement on these fault surfaces. So how do we identify faults in the first place? What is their seismic expression? Well, in some rare cases, fault planes themselves generate reflections. This seismic profile comes from offshore Namibia, and it shows some really spectacular fault plane reflections. Let's just zoom in, and you can identify those arcuate, fairly steeply dipping reflections coming across the image from top right to bottom left, like this. Here's one just picked out. So the fault plane itself generated a reflection, and we can continue to trace the fault away from this reflective part into the upper part of the section to see where it offsets that bright stratal reflection just at the arrowhead at the um, upper arrow, like this. So fault plane reflections are really useful. They don't represent the full extent of the fault plane, they're just a guide to where to start and we can continue to extend our fault planes into other areas that are less reflective, looking for offsets in the stratigraphic markers. To get an idea of the sense of offset on this fault, we can look at the behaviour of the stratal reflectors uh, in the adjacent rocks. Here we can see in the hanging wall, they make a fan. The strata increase in thickness, in other words, the separation between these picked stratal reflectors increases towards the fault plane. So we're looking at a rotational displacement that is a normal fault down throwing something like this. So the workflow is to identify fault components, trace out the continuity of the fault, and then interpret the sense of movement and show this with a half arrow. But not all faults generate reflections. In fact, very few fault planes generate primary reflections. In this particular case, the fault plane itself is not directly visible. But can we interpret it? Where does the fault go? Well, there's clearly some sort of discontinuity running through the image between these two arrows. We're recognising this as a fault because of the breaks with offsets of the stratal reflectors. Here, and by joining up these breaks, I'm only showing them on one side of the fault, we can infer the presence and continuity of the fault plane. Now, the ability to identify breaks of stratal reflectors is dependent upon the image quality in the first place. In the main part of this profile, the seismic character is represented by these continuous high frequency stratal reflectors. Now this gives us great definition. In the lower part of the profile, below that bright high amplitude reflector, seismic character is somewhat degraded. The frequency is lower, in other words, the spacing of the reflectors is higher, and they're a bit more discontinuous. If we look to the left, this area is really noisy, 
and the stratal reflectors are discontinuous and disjointed. That's not to say that they're broken by faults. It's the signal quality is not as high as it is elsewhere in the image. So the ability to trace faults is going to be dependent on the quality of the seismic image. Let's trace out this reflector, which seems to run right across the image like this. Hmm, that's quite interesting because it suggests there's hardly any offset across the fault. Let's zoom in and put that yellow pick across. And I'm going to say that that is a mistime, in other words, it's a miscorrelation across the fault zone, even though it looked like the reflector itself continued across the fault. Because I think this is a better correlation across this part of the fault zone, like this. In our initial interpretation with the yellow line, we've joined green to blue, in other words, we've mismatched one stratal horizon with another. And we can see that our second interpretation here that we've begun to build makes sense if we build in other stratal reflectors. And we can see that the displacement across our inferred fault is more or less conserved down the profile. And let's just take the seismic image away and see these offsets. Here would be the fault. And we can see the sense of offset and the amount of offset is broadly conserved along the fault trace. So there's a systematic offset pattern. This is a really critical part of a quality assurance in our structural interpretation, looking at the offset pattern. And it allows us then to identify mistimes. We already had one that we started with, but there's another one at the bottom of our zoom in down there where we can see that red amplitude running across the screen. No offset on the fault, and that's because of a mistime. Those do not join up. The act of creating the seismic image has smeared the amplitudes across the fault zone apparently joining up reflectors when they're not the same geological entity. So in this particular example, we might think the fault itself goes from arrowhead to arrowhead through the seismic volume as a continuous surface like this. Not necessarily a straight line, it can have irregularities representing true dip variations in the fault plane with depth. But actually, if we zoom into this part, we can see that we can correlate the um, black amplitude anomaly across the fault like that, that reflector from arrowhead to arrowhead. That shows the correct correlation, but it's not broken at the fault. Rather, it folds across the fault. The amount of movement to the right-hand side of that image relative to the left is conserved, but it doesn't happen on a fault. It happens across a, a sort of fold or shear zone. So it's possible to draw the fault interpretation something like this. So the fault itself consists of different strands connected by these sort of relay zones where the rocks connect through but are deformed in the gap between the fault segments. And it's a real challenge understanding from the seismic profile whether we've got one continuous fault surface or we've got a relaying set of segments. Now, the interpretation we've built so far from the high frequency part of the data set has been relatively straightforward, notwithstanding this last complexity. Let's go and look below that high amplitude reflector into the noisier part of the seismic image, which lies below. And here is a zoom in of the continuity of this fault lower down in the section. And we can ask of this image, are we dealing with a continuous fault zone or are we dealing with relaying discrete fault segments? Well, the fault zone itself we can sort of pick through arrowhead to arrowhead through here. And we might be tempted to draw a great fat fault running through the whole thing as a continuous fault surface. The fault displacement would still be right side down like this. But an alternative to a single through going fault may be a highly segmented structure like this. With lots of fault strands connecting through the system. Let's add some stratigraphic formations onto this image. So here are our correlations across the fault zone. Notice in this case, the displacement in our fault is increasing with depth, and we're interpreting the sequence above the brown formation that's at the bottom here 
Well, the units above that are shown as being a growth sequence. In other words, they were deposited during the faulting. So as you go up towards the high amplitude unornamented reflector at the top of the image here, well, those rocks were barely deposited uh, towards the end of the life of this fault, whereas the brown formation at the base has seen the accumulation of many fault slip increments. So the interpretation makes geological sense, and the fault zone consists of a series of highly segmented uh, fault strands. What happens in the bits between? How is the deformation in here accommodated? Is it accommodated by folding or by strain or lots of little faults? Well, the size of the image is not sufficient to discriminate between these options. Let's just take away all the graffiti and just look at the seismic image again. I think we'd all agree there was a fault zone running through here, but the nature of the structure of the fault zone is open to debate. Is it a through-going single strand or a multi-segmented fault zone with relays? In many areas of applied geology, understanding the difference in these two models is critical because the continuity of rock units from hanging wall to fault wall across the fault is different for these two models. And these choices impact on our forecasts of how subsurface reservoirs may perform. Regardless of this, there's a general strategy for thinking about fault zones. We want to show the faults on our image. We want to make decisions about continuity or segmented natures of fault zones. We want to label the sense of movement with these half arrows and then assess the displacements to make sure they make geological sense. So a quick introduction to the expression of faults on seismic profiles. We've seen that sometimes the faults themselves can generate reflections. But in many cases we infer the presence of faults not by this direct reflection evidence but by identifying stratal terminations and then interpreting the position and geometry of the fault itself. In areas of high frequency data, this can become relatively straightforward, although there's still a problem of mistie that we have to look out for. But in noisy discontinuous data, such as on the right, we have an issue of distinguishing complex structure from complex image. So the degrees of freedom in our interpretation increase as we move from left to right across this set of examples. And of course, the greater the structural complexity, the greater the challenges for seismic imaging, not only because of migration issues, but also from dimming and changing the character of our stratal reflectors in and out of the fault zones.